some of the interesting stuff um, about how cells produce uh, patterns on the surface. So yesterday we talked about protrusions, and today we'll talk about how you actually initiate such structures on the surface of the of the cells. So uh, you know, cells come in all kinds of very different shapes when you look at them, and uh, you can ask the question, of course, what what gives them these uh, strange shapes. Um, this is the shape of the whole cell that you can ask and you can also then of course zoom in on different parts of the cell and ask what is actually providing the structure here or in this uh, area and for example what is labeled here in green are adhesion molecules which adhere this cell to the substrate so clearly whenever you have this adhesion it seems that it's associated with some protrusion of the membrane um, you don't see the membrane, but it's sort of outlined by uh, covering the entire surface of the cell, looking from, this, from the top. So this is like a 2D projection of a very flat cell on the surface. Um, and of course, you can zoom in on specific protrusions like we did yesterday and ask the question of how are they built, what determines their height and their thickness. And uh, as we said, it's all uh, related to this actin, which is... Um, building the internal core of these uh, protrusions. Uh, these actin filaments, which we talked yesterday about how they polymerize in a, in a directed fashion, in a way that is providing uh, treadmilling and providing a force that's pushing the membrane uh, outwards. Um, now you can also go back a little bit and ask, okay, so we talked about how a full-fledged protrusion gets built, but how does the cell actually uh, initiate the fact that here there will be a protrusion and here there will not be a protrusion? How does the cell actually break the uniformity of the membrane and actually initiates this uh, pattern, if you want, that is eventually going to grow later into a protrusion? Now, a protrusion uh, can be thought of as something which is cylindrical and finger-like, like we talked yesterday, but one can think of this entire front of the cell as a protrusion also. And why does the cell produce such a protrusion only here? And then we will call this the cell front and not here in the back. Or why not make several such uh, protrusions along the perimeter of the cell? So what, are the, what, what determines the patterns that, uh, that form on the cell? Now, this question of pattern formation appears, of course, in many, many contexts outside of the context of uh, cell shapes. And usually people, uh, um, uh, well, not usually, but one mechanism that people have um, suggested and found in many different systems to provide patterns is um, a system of uh, a reaction diffusion uh, of chemicals. So you have uh, two species of chemicals that are reacting with each other and also diffusing. Uh, one can be associated with one diffusion coefficient, another one with another diffusion coefficient. The arrows here and these uh, lines with the blunt end are supposed to signify uh, positive feedback and negative feedback. So uh, in this case, the species X is providing a positive feedback on itself. It's enhancing its own production. Uh, it's uh, enhancing the production of Y. Y is inhibiting itself, but is also inhibiting the, the other species. If you write uh, equations, um, uh, differential equations for the um, uh, density of the two species, Y and X, in space, you can find that under uh, the right conditions and the right um, non-linearity of the interactions between them, you can get um, uh, different patterns that form. As shown here in this uh, example, you can have uh, dots forming, you can have stripes, and you can have different patterns that form spontaneously in, on these uh, two-dimensional domains. So um, one thing you can say immediately is that that must be what is happening in the cell, that there is the cell membrane, which is a two-dimensional surface. There's lots of biochemistry going on inside the cell. Surely there is... Um, uh, several species of molecules that I can identify that ad adsorb to the membrane 
and maybe also uh, uh, fall off the membrane, but while on the membrane they are reacting with each other in a manner which forms some positive and negative feedback cycles, and that should produce some pattern. And once this pattern of chemicals on the membrane is formed, then that sort of templates the actin to go and grow in those positions. So if you think maybe the, the black species here is uh, a, a nucleator of actin, whenever I got a high concentration of this uh, uh, protein in this point because of some chemical reactions, then now actin will be recruited to this point and begin to push and I will get a nice uh, protrusion of the kind that we talked about yesterday. Um, so that would be one way of looking at it, and there are many uh, um, theoretical papers that you can find that explain uh, cell patterns, uh, shape patterns of cells, and also the polarization of cell globally between front and back, like we said for, for a cell that has a, a clear front and a clear back, all based on this idea of reaction diffusion equations. What I wanted to... Um, so, yeah, just to show you that uh, you can read many uh, papers that show beautiful patterns that form through this reaction diffusion in, uh, um, in uh, biology. But uh, we, we suggested already a long time ago um, that the, there might be an interesting feedback from the actin itself, from the, from, the, um, uh, from the fact that while you are shaping the cell, and you're deforming the membrane, you can actually get uh, a positive feedback or a negative feedback from the shape itself. So the shape is not just um, a, a passive template. The membrane is not just a passive template on which these um, uh, patterns form. And then once they form, then actin simply comes along and pushes out a protrusion. But the, the, the actin that is pushing on the membrane and deforming the membrane can also be a, 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 um, an important part in this positive and negative feedback. So that was the idea, to put in some mechanical feedback through the shape of the membrane uh, into this uh, pattern formation. Um, okay, so this is basically, in a nutshell, the idea that we've been playing with already for a long time, that on the membrane you can have uh, proteins uh, or complexes of proteins. I will call them proteins, but I will not give many names of proteins. So think of them very generally as, um, as complexes of proteins, although I will show you a few examples of specific proteins. Proteins that can attach to the membrane. So the membrane is shown here with lots of other proteins stuck inside. And what's unique about these proteins is that, as you see by their shapes, they are intrinsically curved. So they have a spontaneous curvature. They, they are, um, if you think of it like a roof tiles that have some specific rigid, let's think of it for the moment as a rigid shape. So once they attach to the membrane because of some chemical affinity, they will bend the membrane. So they both bend the membrane, but they're also behaving as sensors of curvature because they, they, will, um, uh, they will have a higher energy for binding to a place which doesn't fit their shape compared to a place which fits their shape perfectly. So in that sense, where they go on the membrane is also dependent on the local shape of the membrane. So they both change the shape of the membrane, but they're also affected, I mean, the local density on the membrane is affected by the shape of the membrane, okay? And now add the additional uh, um, ingredient that these proteins are also able to nucleate actin polymerization. So they locally induce actin polymerization below them in the membrane, which at the minimum can push the membrane outwards. The actin can also do other things, but at the minimum it pushes the membrane outwards. So you have now an interesting coupling between shape, uh, density of these proteins on the membrane, uh, shape of the membrane, and also the, the, the force that, that is produced both by the bending due to the shape of these proteins and by the actin uh, pushing outwards. So in other words, if you think about what we did yesterday, we, de we dealt with what is actually allowing you to build a nice structure like that, but we didn't say why does the actin actually go there, we just said, yes, actin is polymerizing as a bundle, and what are the balance of forces 
that allows this structure to actually grow. But now we want to ask, what are the initial stages of actually initiating, at that particular point, uh, the protrusion to grow? So, yes, please. Yes. Yes. So, so that's a very good question. So um, indeed, in general, we will be dealing with both uh, proteins that bend the membrane outwards and also bending the membrane inwards. Um, and uh, so that's uh, regarding the shape of the, of the proteins. Now, about the forces that the actin can produce, here I'm only talking about protrusive forces that push outwards, but you're very right that actin can also induce um, forces that go into the cell, and I will actually give an example of that. Um, but but there, are, there are different kinds. So one kind of, uh, of um, force that the actin can produce into the cell is simply contraction, and, and that's because we know that there's myosin-2 motors, and myosin-2 mo motors, they can grab anti-parallel um, actin filaments, walk on them in the opposite directions, and therefore give contractility. And contractility is like, you know, if I, I would be inside a big balloon and you don't see me and I grab the balloon and I do like that, it contracts inwards rather than I push outwards. Um, but there's, there's now I, uh, several works that show that actin actually, even without myosin, just by polymerizing, can actually locally induce um, an inwards force, um, which has been shown uh, actually for... Um, um, several invaginations that can actually be pulled into, into, the, into the cell itself by actually only actin polymerization. So it, I would say that actin can also induce an inwards force, but uh, the, one, the example that I will give is related to myosin contractility. But there's recent uh, evidence that maybe locally you can also have inwards motion uh, due to only actin polymerization. And actually, yesterday, Pomo showed me a very beautiful experiment where only actin depolymerization can use also a form of, of uh, contractile motion. So I would say we are, not, we are not yet sure about all the kinds of forces that actin alone can produce. Surely it can produce a protrusive force. That's, that's what we can understand more easily. Uh, but even locally, it can produce an inwards force. Um, with myosin, of course, we understand that's contractility, muscle-like. Uh, but there are other mechanisms probably also. Okay. So, um, so the basic uh, kind of feedback that we have, we have three components for this feedback. We have the deformation of the cell membrane. We have the active forces uh, that the, of the cytoskeleton, which at the moment think of them as only protrusive forces because that's the easiest ones to think about. And the, the, one, the, the, the coupling between them is done by these curved proteins, which are mobile, for example, they can attach and detach of the membrane, or, and, they can be floating and flowing inside the, the membrane. The membrane is a fluid, and for example, this one is uh, shown here schematically by this arrow moving to a, a place where its local curvature uh, matches better the shape of the membrane. And if you want to draw, again, arrows of uh, feedback, then you have a feedback like that, that the active forces induce a pushing force on the membrane, which deforms the membrane outwards. As the membrane deforms outwards, it locally has a shape which better fits this kind of specific outwards curving proteins. So there is a positive feedback here. The more you have of these proteins, they recruit more of these active forces, and you have here a complete uh, positive feedback loop that can, in principle, lead to pattern formation. Okay, yeah, so we talked already about these three components. So the first component is actin polymerization, but we talked about that yesterday. So it can push outwards by simply polymerizing new, new and new, more and more new units on these uh, growing ends which are pushing the membrane, um, which then, as we said yesterday, pushes the entire bundle into this viscous um, um, network that is below in the cytoplasm, and that gives you effective friction that supports this uh, sort of skyscraper that's pushing the membrane upwards. 
but also it can give a contractile forces, just like was now asking the question. So for example, even in, in, in a leading edge of a cell where the, the actin is not very well organized, it's more like a, a very uh, diffuse network which is going in all kinds of directions, even there, myosin, which is represented here schematically by these uh, red uh, ovals, can actually grab two uh, actin filaments and actually begin to walk on them. Now, if one head of the myosin is walking up here and the other one is walking up here, you end up contracting these, these filaments inwards. And you can see that indeed, uh, in this experiment, what they, did, what they did is that they look at the shape of this leading edge of a cell, which is full of actin polymerization, which is pushing the front, and actin is labeled here in red, and then they put in a drug that actually stops myosin contractility. And what happens, myosin is here in, in green. You see that myosin is a little bit back from the edge of the cell. And as soon as you stop this contractility, the edge of the cell actually shoots out because a lot of the actin pushing was actually mitigated or uh, sort of uh, balanced by this uh, contractile forces of the myosin pulling back. Once you release that, a lot of the pushing force of actin becomes more effective and it pushes out the leading edge of the membrane. A more effective way of converting actin and myosin into to contractile forces is to specifically organize the actin in the form of a ring. And now if you make a, a ring, let's say that uh, uh, each of these actin filaments is um, uh, um, connected to the membrane by these uh, black uh, symbols, and it grows, this one has a plus end here, and this one has a plus end here. So now myosin motors can have really nice anti-parallel uh, filaments to grab on and to walk on them. So you get a very effective contractility, which is now really squeezing this ring. And that's exactly what happens during mitosis. So during uh, cell division, the actin spontaneously forms a, a ring. Uh, again, it needs to form this ring at the middle of the cell, so it's another problem of pattern formation. You don't want this actin to, to form rings everywhere. You want the ring to form in some specific space, place on the, on the membrane. And then once it forms, it begins to contract. And again, you can ask the question, could there be a positive feedback between the uh, localization of these nucleators of the actin and the shape of the membrane? Again, to make a positive feedback, that will spontaneously form this ring right in the right position. So actin can produce a pushing force, let's say for the moment to simplify matters, when myosin is, is uh, recruited, it can also end up pulling the membrane inwards, okay? And the last component is the spontaneous curvature of the proteins. So again, this is only schematic pictures, but by now people know many, many proteins that are associated with membranes. You can have something which is transmembrane, but it simply has a cross-section which is not, not parallel, so it bends locally the lipids, uh, as shown here. It can be something that adsorbs on the outside of the lipid bilayer, only, but, but only on one side, uh, as, as a single unit or as a polymer or some other um, complex of several units that only when they are linked together, they bend the membrane. There can be many other mechanisms. In principle, if you think about it, the, the, the bilayer, as soon as you adsorb anything to the bilayer, which is only on one side and not on the other side, you've ruined the perfect symmetry of the bilayer and you've induced some spontaneous curvature. Because by adsorbing, you necessarily uh, change a little bit, or not a little bit, the lipid packing in the side on which you adsorb. That, that's a necessity of, uh, of chemical uh, binding. And if that's not uh, mirrored on the other side, there you have it. You have an imbalance in the, uh, in the local area per lipid on one leaflet compared to the other leaflet, and that's spontaneous curvature. Okay, so inducing spontaneous curvature is very easy once you adsorb something to the membrane. Any adsorption which is not symmetric will give you some spontaneous curvature. But, um, yeah, so that's actually said here. But cells have specific proteins which have been specifically designed to have a specific kind of curvature. So many of them are members of this bar domain family. It's a family of, uh, well, it's called even a superfamily of proteins. 
Some of them are, are concave, so they are really bending the membrane inwards. Right? This is the inside of the cell, so they bend the membrane into the cell. And the other ones are such that they bend the membrane outwards. Okay? Like if you want to get a protrusion that pushes outward, maybe the tip uh, is more naturally filled with these guys. Um, yeah, so as I said, you can get also um, uh, that um, they, um, they, they bend only when they form some polymer, but the individual unit is not actually highly bent. Uh, and there's many different ways in which they can absorb onto the membrane and induce a spontaneous curvature. Okay. Um, you can even have specific proteins that are sensitive to the Gaussian curvature. So you can have actually specific proteins that are uh, only absorbing to regions that have uh, non-zero uh, Gaussian curvature, which means that you have uh, places which look like uh, saddles or necks of uh, tubes, right, where you have uh, the curvature which is different in two, two directions. Um, in this specific case, this is a negative Gaussian curvature, where the, the curvature is, has different signs in different directions. So it's positive in one direction and negative in the other. And there are specific proteins that are only recruited to such regions. So the, the cell has made uh, the proteins in the shape that are actually sensitive to specific curvature. Um, do such curved membrane proteins also recruit the actin, like we need to complete this feedback, this positive feedback? So yes, for example, this protein um, has been shown to be involved in producing these protrusions and it is recruiting the actin, uh, the actin cytoskeleton. Not directly, but it's binding to some other protein, and together they form a complex that is um, recruiting the actin. Um, this is another example. This cartoon I showed you in, uh, in the start, but it's another example of a protein which is recruited. Uh, so this is the curved protein. It binds to uh, this protein, which is called INAVASP, and together they form a complex which is both curved and polymerizing actin, which are the two properties that we want for our protein to have, or protein complex to have, to complete this positive feedback. The last example, just to show you that you can have all kinds of uh, proteins that, if you look at the individual one, for example, it has no strong curvature, but um, when they form this dimer, uh, the dimer has a spontaneous curvature and is a nucleating actin. This is actually an interesting protein because it's the protein uh, of this kind that I told you yesterday that is this, doing this processive capping, that it has these two legs and it allows the end of the actin filament to grow, but it never uh, lets let go of it. So it actually continuously walks up this filament as new monomers are getting... Uh, um, getting incorporated into the growing end of the filament, and actually that's very effective in producing these uh, bundles. Okay, so uh, AJ and me started thinking about this a long time ago, and you can read the first paper, it's from 2006, and basically the idea is, is what I showed you already in, this, in the cartoons before. What happens if you have a membrane that's originally in the beginning rather flat, and you have a population of these proteins which is, in this case, curved slightly uh, outwards. And you have a slight uh, more of them here, let's say, than in the region between them. Now, because they each induce an outward force, then in the next time uh, point, the, the higher concentration of them here will translate into a larger deformation. But since they like this highly curved shape, they will get squeezed into that region, which is uh, supposed to be shown by these uh, dashed lines, and the same thing happens for these two, and therefore the, um, the, the difference between the dens density of them here and the density of them here only gets increased, so both the density differences get increased and also the shape differences get increased, and so on and so forth, you have a positive feedback that can lead to uh, an instability. And an instability is the, the way we define uh, the initiation of a pattern. Okay, and of course, uh, if you do it for the concave shapes, I don't know why they are shown here as 
hourglass, but it is supposed to be concave, um, then you get the opposite effect because now they like this kind of minima. And as soon as there's more of them here, which push outwards, they get actually pushed away from there and they begin to feel this minima. But once they feel the minima, and since they are still only inducing actin that pushes outwards, then they fill up this minima and it becomes a maxima again, and they get pushed out of there again and again. So you can see that this could be leading to a negative feedback, and a negative feedback either gives you nothing, so it gives a, st a stable system, or it can, in, in principle, give you a wave propagation, which we will deal in, in the next uh, part. So this is the basic model scheme. The, the first paper was with AJ and a few others. Um, uh, and basically, we treat a membrane which is almost flat. The, the local coordinate H gives you the deviation from the flatness. And you have uh, some population of these curved proteins. Wherever they are, they give you a constant force outwards, which is representative of this actin pushing from, from below. And they can diffuse with some diffusion coefficient on the membrane, OK? Uh, you can also uh, take into consideration that they can absorb and desorb from the membrane. Um, now, you can add also other factors. For example, you can add that there is some uh, aggregation between the proteins so that they aggregate with each other, that there is some uh, uh, connection between them, some binding between them. And you can also take into account the effect of Adhesion, if you remember that we saw a cell in the beginning, a picture of a cell that's adhered on, on a substrate. Um, if, you, if you think of, of this two-dimensional image of a cell on the substrate, you know, the nucleus is here, then in these areas where you have adhesion, what does it mean? It means that, in fact, there is um, a, a lower energy for the cell to actually uh, wet more and more the surface because it means that the, the cell... Uh, by spreading on the surface, is, the cell is actually gaining some energy. So the energy goes down. So there's some negative adhesion energy, which is associated with increasing the contact area. And that can be translated in a simple uh, terms to something which is like um, uh, um, a local uh, reduction in the surface tension, which gives you an outward force which is proportional to this reduction, which is given by this parameter alpha, um, the local uh, density of these proteins, which could be the inducers of this adhesion, and the local uh, curvature H, the local mean curvature. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that later. Um, now let's build the free energy of the system, the equations of motion, and then we can do the linear stability analysis. The linear stability analysis will give us the conditions under which we can initiate some pattern. We can have some instability spontaneously forming, um, and, and that's the conditions when pattern form, patterns form. Uh, how am I doing this time? OK, just about. OK, so uh, I think Anna told you about the Monge gauge, which is this idea of uh, describing a memory which is almost flat by this single coordinate. So we don't take into consideration any membranes which uh, have uh, overhangs and things like that. So it's a, it's a single, uh, it's a single valued function. Uh, and um, and uh, it has uh, the, the mean curvature squared as, uh, uh, integrated over the area and with the bending modulus kappa that we saw yesterday also, and also integrating the uh, energy per unit area, which is in other words, just the membrane tension uh, again, over the entire area. Uh, what's this TA here, standing by itself? Oh, okay. Um, so uh, if you think about the area element, since this membrane is not perfectly flat, then this membrane area element uh, is, um, can be developed by Taylor expansion up to second order, and we can keep only second order terms. Yeah, we will want to keep only second order terms in all the free energy that we will show you now, and we will expand the free energy only up to second order terms so that we can do the linear stability analysis so that the equations of motion that we get from this um, uh, free energy will be linear to allow us to do the instability analysis. If, we, if you want to keep nonlinear terms, or at least the, let's say the, the first nonlinear terms, because there's 
infinite number of them, uh, that, that, that is actually essential if you want to run simulations, and I'll show you that in a sec uh, later on. Okay, so now we want to find the, the membrane shape, so we do um, uh, calculus um, uh, uh, to, see, to see the, the, the calculus of variation of, um, of uh, small deformations of the shape of the membrane. Uh, so I'm sure you've done calculus uh, of variation before. Um, so essentially, as I said, we take this uh, free energy up to second order terms. And if you want to, to ask what is the, um, what is the um, shape of it, it, it is given by doing this variation on the free energy. And if you want to, to know the steady state shape, it's equal to zero. But this variation will actually be useful for us in the, free, in the equations of motion. So it's worth doing it. Um, and and uh, OK, so you actually want to do this uh, variation. And if you uh, don't remember how to do that, then you, you simply do that by integration by parts, um, doing this small variation of, of the height as function of position, but holding, of course, the, the boundary conditions, the ends, uh, unchanged. Um, so with that, I, I, with those conditions on the boundaries, you end up um, with the with the equation of, of the equation of motion or the variation of the free energy of the membrane uh, with uh, with changes of the of the membrane shape. So eventually, you get to this equation. And why is this important? To show you that you get here the fourth derivative of uh, of the height and the second derivative of the height. And the fourth derivative of the height simply comes about because we had this uh, bending energy which was going like the second derivative squared. Okay, so that is the reason why we ended up with this fourth derivative. Or in other words, um, if you remember, if you do this variation, you differentiate the free energy with respect to H, but H, the free energy is actually not dependent on H. It does, it does depend uh, on H tag, and, it, and that, that was the tension part. And it does depend on H double tag, which is the second derivative, because that was the curvature part. So this, this term gives you this fourth derivative, and this term gives you the negative of the second derivative. Um, OK, so just, just as a special case, if you have uh, a system which is dominated by by tension, maybe you saw that, like in a soap film, you essentially minimize the energy with only the tension term. Uh, so you, you basically have this equation, and this equation means that locally the, the, the curvature has to be zero, because the curvature is the second derivative. Um, now, zero, zero curvature is, is what is called minimal surface. Uh, and uh, for example, you have this catenoid which forms when you have uh, two uh, loops of wire and you put in uh, some soap film between them and spontaneously it forms this uh, catenoid. Of course, you can have other minimal surfaces which have beautiful shapes, but that's besides the point. Okay, so um, now we can add in the proteins. So the membrane, the free membrane had only this bending energy term and tension term but now we rewrite this bending energy term by writing the curvature, the local curvature, minus this term. So what, what is actually written here? What is written here is the uh, local density of these curved proteins. And you can think of this density as simply a number between 0 and 1. It's like the local uh, uh, probability of having a protein there. So if this is 1, it basically means that this term is zero or minimized when the local curvature of the membrane perfectly equals H0, which is the spontaneous curvature of the protein, okay? So if you think on the continuum limit, N can take any, any value between zero and one. If you think of a discrete description, then you have a protein here with the curvature H0, and locally the membrane bending energy um, is minimized when the membrane perfectly um, uh, fits the shape of the, of the protein. So the assumption here is the protein is perfectly rigid and is essentially uh, its own energy. Uh, it has no bending energy because it's perfectly rigid and it only forces the bending of the, on the membrane. 
That's one way to do it. Um, yeah, another way to do it is to consider that the, that the uh, protein does change locally the, the bending energy of the complex of membrane plus, plus protein, and that means that the effective bending energy of this region is not only just the pure bending energy of the membrane, but it is some bending energy of the membrane plus some effect of bending also of the protein. And that means, that, for example, even if you add now a protein with zero spontaneous curvature, it will change locally the stiffness of the membrane. So a membrane that is covered by these uh, flat proteins wants to be flat, but is still stiffer than a membrane with other proteins. So one can also consider this kind of Hamiltonian, which, which we did in the past, yeah. This one? Uh, yeah, the, the, yes, you're right. The, the square here is wrong. Yeah, it should not be square there. Yeah, it would just be the curvature minus N, N H zero all squared. Yeah, there's, a, there's a, too many squares here. So this squared is, is wrong. You should just ignore it. Thank you. It's the problem of cutting and pasting. Um, now, what other additional energies do we have in this system where we have these mobile proteins which are mobile in the membrane? So we said that they can deform the membrane that was taken care of, um, but they also induce uh, some additional energy terms. One energy term is the fact that you have a 2D gas of these proteins, so you have just the, the entropy of them. Um, just as an ideal gas of, of, of these proteins. For small n, we can uh, use a more compact uh, uh, form of this expression. Um, but we also said that they can interact with each other. So if they interact with each other, uh, let's say by some energy J, um, which has a negative sign, so J will be positive if they attract each other, so that they bind to each other and they form clusters. And that's represented by the fact that you, you lower the energy when the local concentration of them increases. The, the other term here means that you, are, uh, um, you, you take into account the fact that there is energy lost whenever you have edges of the domain. So whenever there is a gradient in N, so inside the domain N is constant, outside of the domain there is no N, so again N is constant. But whenever you reach the edges of the domain, you have some bonds which are missing, and you take that into account with this uh, um, gradient term. Okay. Um, okay, so now we want to write the equations of motion for the um, changes in H and changes in N. We have uh, two, two variables in our problem, uh, N and H. So we start with H, and we want to calculate the, the shape uh, deformations as function of time of the membrane. Um, so, in principle, this is a complex problem because, because of hydrodynamic flows, if I apply a force at one point on the membrane, it actually affects the motion of the membrane far away because of these hydrodynamic flows which have to be set up in order to move through a fluid. Um, and we know how to take that into account for, uh, for a, f a free fluid. But inside the cell, um, there is lots of um, um, the, the, the flows, at least on the inside of the cell, are highly restricted by this network of actin filaments and other uh, molecules. So at least um, to begin with, we will neglect uh, these hydrodynamic flows and we will assume that all the forces and the motions are all local. Uh, this is a, a strong assumption. It, it, it's rather okay for cells but we can also r remove it and do the full um, uh, case with the hydrodynamics. Um, just to remind you that we are neglecting inertia, so when I will write the equations of motion, I will assume that all the forces add up to zero. There's no acceleration. We are in the limit of small Reynolds number. To remind you what's a Reynolds number, it's the ratio between inertial forces and friction forces. So it's basically the density of the fluid times the speed 
times the length scale of your, of your motion or your object uh, divided by the viscosity. And so for a one micron length motion, um, at these speeds, uh, the Reynolds number is indeed very small. So you are like in honey, okay? It's like I would put you in honey. That's what the cells feel the, from the water around them, okay? Um, they're not in honey, they're in water, but that's what it feels like. Um, so we can write an equation of motion, which, as we said, is going to be local. So the friction, which is simply some friction coefficient times the speed, is going to be equal to all the other forces that are uh, applied on the membrane. The, the, the first part of the forces is simply coming from the variation of the free energy. So we'll do that in a second. So that, that's the calculus of variation that we already did for the free membrane. Um, and the other term is simply the pushing force of actin, which we will take to be linearly related to the amount of these proteins, minus the average amount of them, because we don't, we don't want that in the uniform case, the membrane simply moves up and up and up. So this, this motion is, is canceled by some fact that we are part of a big cell, even though we are looking on a small flat piece. This is sort of part of a big cell, and the membrane will not float off forever. So there is something that keeps us all locked in the same place, so we just remove the average uh, number of these proteins. We want to see only the formations with respect to this average. Okay, so we need go, to go back to do this cal uh, uh, calculation of the variation. So this is the part that we are now going to do, and we saw that already before. So to do this variation, you basically differentiate with respect to H and to the gradient of H and to the uh, second derivative of H, etc. Um, and as I said, we keep only up to second order terms. So again, this superfluous squared here, forget about it. And if you now take this free energy and you put it through this variation, you get these terms. So again, the first term is something that we saw before. Um, so, so, sorry, this is only the part that comes from the bending. So what we saw before for the free uh, membrane was only this term. Now we have two new terms that come from the fact that we have this uh, spontaneous curvature of the proteins. One is this one, and this is the second one, and we'll now explain what, what they mean. Okay, so if I have a small bump in the membrane, so H looks like this, then the curvature, which is the second derivative of this shape, has this, this shape, okay? Um, so the first term, which comes also for the free membrane, uh, is the, the minus kappa times the fourth derivative. You can convince yourself that if this is the second derivative, which took a positive part and made it negative, differentiating twice more to get the fourth derivative will give you a positive number, a positive number times a negative uh, sign gives you a negative force, and that's indeed the direction in which this force should go, which means that the bending energy wants to restore the system to uniformity. Okay, so, so far, sanity check, the first term for a free membrane works as we expect for such, a, for such an outwards protrusion. Now we look at the second terms, uh, the other terms, so here, what happens is that the membrane is actually sort of accommodating uh, to the spontaneous curvature of the membrane. And that, that, uh, that uh, is a force that is pushing upwards. And this force which is pushing upwards essentially means that the, that the, the, um, the, the membrane is indeed pushed upwards by the spontaneous curvature of the, of the proteins if the proteins have uh, the shape which is given here, which for this shape, the spontaneous curvature needs to be negative. So why do I say the force is, is positive if I say that H0 is negative? Because the second derivative of N for an accumulation of N here would be also negative, right? So if N has an accumulation at this point, which means that N also has a maximum just like H has, it means that the second derivative of n has a minimum there, which is a negative number. So this is negative, h0 is negative. The total uh, contribution of this term is positive, and it does, again, what we expect it to do. These curved proteins aggregated at a single point 
bend the membrane outwards, which is what we expect them to do, because they have this specific spontaneous curvature. If the spontaneous curvature is opposite and they are concave, H0 is positive, and this whole term becomes of opposite sign, and indeed it will bend the membrane inwards. So again, sanity check, it gives us what we, we want. Um, and the last term, you can already see that this term doesn't care about the sign of the spontaneous curvature. It goes like the spontaneous curvature squared and the, the mean uh, density of these proteins. So it doesn't care about the aggregation of these uh, uh, proteins. And uh, it, 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 it behaves as if the, uh, uh, the added uh, curved proteins essentially sort of add an effective additional tension to the membrane, and any additional tension to the membrane adds a term which goes uh, with this uh, um, Laplacian, and, and it means that on effect, in, in some effect, you are, uh, by, by having this spontaneous curvature, they are sort of inflating or tensing the membrane as a whole. So it's like the whole membrane wants to be part of, of a balloon, either outwards or inwards, doesn't matter, and that's additional tension which is stretching the membrane. If you only have tension, then this is the term. This, this didn't change because of the proteins. Um, the entropy term that we had, um, the entropy term that we had gives, gives us uh, uh, a force that behaves like this, which again looks like a tension term because it goes only like uh, some, something which has to do with the average number of these proteins times the Laplacian. So it is again looking like a tension term. And that is actually a, an interesting tension term because the, the, the proteins behave like a 2D uh, gas on the membrane. So when you have, if you think about the balloon and you have more of these gas, they, the gas wants to expand. So it wants the balloon to expand so it has more surface on which to move, right? And therefore it acts like a tension. So again, it's like an inflating tension that inflates the the, the membrane. Um, the attraction, uh, the, the binding interaction between the proteins, and another term which again looks like a tension term, but in this case it's, it's the opposite. It actually acts, uh, well it has a positive and a negative sign, so it's not clear if it's either expanding or, or contracting the, the membrane overall. Um, so th so th 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 these were all the terms that are related to forces that are acting on the shape of the membrane. Now we have to write the equation of motion for the proteins themselves, and that equation of motion is simply coming from the conservation of the proteins. So basically we write the conservation equation for the proteins, and now the challenge is to calculate these currents of these proteins in the plane of the membrane. So how do we go about doing that? Um, we basically calculate the gradient in the a chemical potential and the gradient and the chemical potential is simply the variation of this free energy, the same free energy that we wrote before with all the different terms, uh, but now not with respect to H but with respect to N. So the mobility is given by this big lambda, NS was defined before to be like the, the one over the size of the protein, so it's some uh, molecular scale, and the mobility is related to the usual diffusion coefficient by this relation. So essentially, at the end of the day, you have a current which is related to the gradient of this variation. So now again, you take the free energy that you, you know, cooked up, calculated, whatever terms you have in the free energy, now you put it through this variation and you can uh, calculate your, your currents. So again, I'm, um, I'm writing the, the, the bending term, again, with this wrong a square here. Um, and to remind you, J is related by this relation. So if you do that, you get this uh, expression for the uh, bending related current of these proteins on the membrane. So again, we can, we can go over this uh, protein. So again, there's one current which really shows you that it's dependent on the sign of H0. And that will tell you that this term is really related to the coupling between the shape of the proteins and the membrane. And indeed, it's the, it's the important flow which flows them onto the region which perfectly matches their shape. 
Yeah, and, th and there's a part which doesn't care about the spontaneous curvature because you see that it goes like the spontaneous curvature squared, so it doesn't care about the shape of the spontaneous curvature if it's up or down, and that only tells them to uh, simply um, um, uh, to, to disperse. And that, that tells them to disperse because wherever they aggregate, they increase the tension, so that's simply a current where the membrane is trying to disperse them because by aggregating them, it costs membrane tension. So there's, an, there's a, a back reaction from the membrane on this uh, flow of these proteins. From the interaction uh, that, that tries to aggregate them, you have this kind of current, which is proportional to J and basically tells you how strongly they try to aggregate together because of, because of the binding interaction they have between them. And the entropy term simply gives you the simple uh, current that you all know and love from simple diffusion. So that was the only term that uh, is simple to calculate and you, you, you see it and you say, ah, okay, that's the only one I really recognize here in all this mess. Um, so the whole, the whole messy thing at the end of the day is that you have an equation of motion for N with all these terms in the, in the currents. You have an equation of motion for H which we simplified greatly by taking it to be completely local and it has all these terms in the, in the forces which go into these forces that were derived here plus the actin, uh, uh, actin induced forces which is simply linear in N. And now you ask when is this system of H and N becoming unstable? So for that you do linear stability analysis. Ah, this should not appear here at this time. Um, and essentially um, what you do is that you say, okay, H, I start with an H which is perfectly uniform, either constant or you can simply take it to be zero just as well. Um, and there is a small fluctuation, small deformation. Simply N has some average value which is uniform and a small deformation, small uh, deflection from this uniform value. And I now do a, a, a Fourier transform into Q and, and T. So T space will be assumed to uh, behave as, as this simple exponential and omega will be the, the eigenvalue that we will be looking for that will tell us if omega is positive or negative and that will tell us if this small fluctuation, small deformation is actually increasing with time or decreasing with time. So that will be very important. And of course the spatial uh, behavior is, is captured by this, um, this uh, Fourier transform of the spatial part. So we can rewrite this uh, system of equations of motion uh, as, uh, as uh, equations that have this matrix that relates H and Q, uh, H and N uh, in, Q, in Q space um, to uh, their uh, time, time derivative. So in other words, if, if we uh, plug in this definition, we can get this algebraic relation. And that has solutions when the determinant of this matrix is zero. And the solutions are given by these, uh, these two uh, eigenvalues which are related to the trace and to the determinant of this uh, matrix L. Uh, now the matrix L can be complicated. <laughs> uh, that's, uh, that's not shown here yet in this slide, so everything looks cool because everything is written very compactly, but L can be complicated because of all these terms that you forgot now but were on the previous slide. So for example, if you write now the matrix, and I apologize that some of the notation has been changed, because I took it from another paper where n was changed to psi for some reason um, and, uh, and the tension from tau to big sigma. Anyway, um, uh, you can see that you get this two by two matrix and all the fourth derivatives are now q to the four and the second derivatives are q to, the, to q squared. And, um, and the, the, the problem is to find the eigenvalues of this two by two matrix. And we want the instability condition, we want the condition when these eigenvalues are just becoming zero so that they are changing from negative to positive and that will tell us what are the uh, conditions on all of these parameters or on some of these parameters uh, that will give you the initiation of this uh, instability. So 
Um, if you just have H and N of the kind that we talked before that have this curvature which is convex, uh, you, you have this positive feedback going between them because more N means more protrusion, more protrusion attracts more of these uh, proteins and you have a positive feedback. And that was the original idea with AJ a long time ago. And the idea is to, to say that sometimes you can see at the edge of cells many, many of these protrusions that form roughly equally spaced. And you might try to say that, oops, that this equal spacing is related to your solution of this omega's function of Q of, of, the, of this uh, two by two matrix, because under the right conditions, you can have a solution which has this shape. So for large Q, so for very short wavelength length fluctuation, the bending is so strong that you're always negative. So nothing can initiate at such very short wavelengths. But as the wavelength is increasing, so Q is decreasing, if you remember Q is just uh, uh, 2 pi over the lambda, um, then you reach a, a critical point where uh, the wavelength uh, gives you a, an eigenvalue uh, which is becoming positive. And, and more than that, there is an eigenvalue at which the uh, omega is maximal. So that would be the wavelength at which small fluctuations will grow fastest, right? Because omega gives you the rate of growth of these fluctuations. So you can, you can think that maybe you will, uh, these initiation sites or this initiation wavelength will win over all the others and the protrusions will eventually grow out there because all we are calculating is just the initiation stages. So maybe the ones that win in the initiation will end up also giving rise to a full-fledged protrusion. And you can see sometimes on the edge of cells real protrusions that look like, well, they're not really equally spaced, but they, it looks like there are many of them at some rather um, finite spacing, and you can suggest at least that this has any relation to this maximum of the, um, of the, of the calculated uh, instability. Um, you can also add another term, as we said in the beginning, related to this adhesion, where uh, you, you, you incorporate adhesion as, again, something that is lowering the local tension, the local effective tension in a way which is dependent on the number of these proteins. And if you do that, you can write a phase diagram where as function of the actin force, which is now given F, uh, in, and, and the adhesion strength, you can have um, uh, a phase transition from a state where the system is uniform, what we call here the mixed state, and then it undergoes uh, two kinds of bifurcations, uh, and you can try to um, uh, maybe convince yourself that these uh, bifurcations have something to do with the shapes of cells. I'm, I'm saying you can try to convince yourself because you have always the limitations that all that you calculated, although it gives you nice phase diagrams and uh, analytic solutions, is only limited to the linear regime of small fluctuations. And only tomorrow I will talk about how to go beyond small fluctuation. Another example of um, initiation of patterns on the surface of the, of the membrane, which we found sort of by chance, because we were not thinking of that, but when you think about it a little bit more, it has all the ingredients of this positive feedback that we were discussing, um, is this example. And what you see here is HIV viruses that form a, a, a small a, a virion or a small cap of proteins on the membrane, and they bud out. They were caught here in the, in the process of budding out from an infected cell. So you can see that they are beginning to aggregate on the membrane, that's the membrane of the cell, and it looks like something is pushing them from below. And when you look at AFM pictures, it looks that whenever you have a budding site, there are these long filaments that come out of there. And it turns out that these filaments are actin. So it turns out that this virus is actually recruiting the actin to push it out of the membrane. A little bit like this bacteria that we saw in the beginning yesterday that is uh, recruiting actin polymerization in order to move like a rocket inside the infected cell. Here it's using this actin in order to bud out. By the way, these experiments were done with HIV, which is not infectious to humans, so there was no real danger for anyone. And you can actually do a mutation on this virus and not allow it to recruit actin. 
you see that it can still bud from the membrane, but it needs now a much, much higher concentration of its own proteins to begin to form these aggregates to begin to bud as compared to um, a, a cell where it can uh, recruit the actin and it can bud out much, much more quickly. So again, you can do the linear stability analysis. And so, by the way, that's a scheme of what's going on here. And you can immediately see that the proteins of the, of the virus have exactly the properties that we want. They are naturally curved because they form the tiles of a perfect sphere and they recruit actin polymerization. So they have, again, again, exactly the two components that we said are needed for this positive feedback and this uh, spontaneous instability to occur. And indeed, if you calculate using this linear stability analysis, what's the critical density of them on the, on the surface that will initiate the aggregation, this instability, you find that as the actin protrusion force is increasing from zero, this critical density decreases by a, a very large uh, amount. And that we think can explain what they saw, that without the actin polymerization, yes, budding indeed eventually occurred, but at a much higher surface concentration of these proteins as compared to without the actin. So it's another example, yeah, that's shown here, with no actin, higher concentration of these proteins needed for budding and much lower concentration of them with the actin. Um, I was asked about, about inwards motion, so I, I will only say that we only also did exactly the same kind of characterization of, um, of uh, uh, a, a curved proteins, but now curved uh, inwards, with the ability of also inducing contractility by some magic. It makes this ring with myosin, and that gives contractility. And again, you can see that that gives you an instability that spontaneously leads to formation of these patterns of rings all along cylinders, or, um, and, and that can be related to how bacteria and other um, cells find their middle uh, for division. Um, so you can extend all this kind of uh, linear stability analysis also for other geometries, such as cylindrical geometries, for example. So all we did is not limited to just uh, planar surfaces. You can also take some other well-defined surface, for example, a cylinder, and do a small uh, fluctuation, small deformation around the, the cylindrical shape. Now I just, if I have a little bit more time, do I? Yeah, a little bit more time. I'll just show you what happens when you have another kind of instability, and that's a wave instability. So why are we looking for wave instability? Because there are waves in cells. So for example, this is a nice movie of uh, the edge of a cell, and I, I, thought, I think you saw uh, this big tsunami that was going backwards. So apparently there's contractile, contractile motions, and these contractile motions can initiate the propagation of waves on the, membrane, on, on the membrane of the cells. Now, these are not waves uh, that are propagating, uh, uh, you know, inertially, just like uh, uh, um, waves on the pond after you threw, after you threw um, a stone, because everything here is overdamped and in, in the low Reynolds number regime. So, in order for anything to propagate a significant distance, it must be powered by energy-consuming processes. Um, so, so waves have been shown to, to exist on the surface of cells, on many, many cell types, and we approach this problem, as I already said in the beginning, by adding now the, the, this uh, possibility of myosin motors to come on and off to the actin filaments, which are produced by these curved proteins. And once you have enough of these myosin motors, they produce now a force which, unlike this force which is pushing of the actin alone, you have now a force which is contractile, and in the simplest way we can think of it's just downwards, okay? You can also say that this contractility is, is pulling a little bit sideways, so it should bring things together. We didn't, we didn't enter into that, into that issue yet. So essentially, what we have is a system like that. We have the same old positive feedback that we had before, but now, whenever you have a lot of actin, myosin begins to hang onto that, uh, onto that actin, and myosin contractility is now pushing H, pulling H downwards. So you have this negative feedback 
on the value of h. Instead of h increasing, it now goes down. So you now added this negative feedback to a positive feedback cycle, and that can give you uh, not just um, uh, damped waves, but unstable waves, waves that get, again, initiated. They have an imaginary part, which is the wave part, but they also have a real part, which is positive, which means increasing with time, amplitude increasing with time. So how do we add it into the equation? So first of all, as I said in the beginning, we, we can't go beyond the, the local limit of uh, having uh, ignore the, the hydrodynamic uh, interactions. Here we do uh, uh, take into account the hydrodynamic interactions simply by integrating over all space and adding this, uh, what is called the OSIN tensor, which relates the force at position R uh, tag to the velocity at position R. Uh, and and it, it, uh, eventually, when you Fourier transform it, it has a very simple form, so it, don't be scared. Um, this, is the, this is the pushing force that we had before, and we added now a negative uh, force, that's the negative sign here, with amplitude A star, which is related to the amount of myosin motors that are, that are there. There's another kernel here, which is just some complication that, that you can ignore now. And the, the equation of motion for the proteins, we use here a simplified form. You, you have the, the, the simple thermal diffusion, and you have the current which brings them together in the direction of where the, the curvature best fits their shape or pushes them away from where the curvature doesn't fit their shape. All the other terms which were coming from the fact that um, they interact with each other and try to aggregate with each other, we threw out, just, just for simplicity. And you have now an additional equation of motion for the myosins, but that's super easy. We kept it at linear uh, kinetics on and off rate. They are attached to the actin, and uh, they, they are... Um, they are um, they are brought in from some, uh, some infinite reservoir of myosin which exists in the cell, so we don't conserve their overall amount, okay? So they just come on to the, to the actin and they, they, uh, they drop off um, with some concentrate K off. So you, you now have a 3x3 three three matrix. So you can say, oh my god, 3x3 three three matrix, that's a nightmare. So you're, you can still have closed uh, solutions, but you're right, it's much more difficult to analyze. Already from two to three is much more difficult to analyze, but it's doable. Um, and you can look at the solutions for omega, for omega tag and omega double tag, the, the imaginary part. So first of all, if you have no myosin, you still have the same solution that we saw before, that you can be in the condition where the green line represents the solution. You have a positive region of instability for large wavelengths, a, a, a stable for short wavelengths and no imaginary part. The, the green is absolutely on the zero here and you, you're, back, you're back to protrusions that either grow or here uh, at this wavelength or shrink at, sh at smaller wavelengths uh, and, and that's it. Nothing is propagating. But as you increase the, the, the myosin contractility, you see that you begin to get this uh, uh, um, imaginary part Initially, for the red one, you have an imaginary part, but all your uh, real part has gone to negative. So by inducing this contractility, you killed completely the, 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 the instability of the protrusions. So now you have, yes, you have waves, but they are completely damped waves. So that's not what you were looking for. But if you crank up the, the myosin contractility, you now get the conditions, for example, with this uh, uh, cyan one, where you have uh, uh, both an imaginary part, actually the imaginary part is almost linear, which is like a, a constant uh, uh, speed uh, wave velocity, and you have a large region of uh, positive part also in the real part, which means that you have real wave instability. And this is like a sound velocity because it's almost linear. Um, you can actually get a simple wave equation that is hiding in, this, uh, in these complicated equations if you throw out all the terms in the limit of very large myosin contractility and you assume that in that limit all that you have that affects the, the, the membrane shape is only the myosin contractility and for the, uh, for the myosin they are, only, they, they are only adsorbed on lots of actin and you simplify and you simplify, and again, at the, and 
and at the end, you get this equation of motion only for n. So the third derivative with time, and the, um, the second derivative with time, etc. And you get a, a, a speed of sound which, uh, which shows you that it should be dependent only on the myosin contractility and doesn't depend on the acting uh, protrusive force. Uh, it depends on the spontaneous curvature, on the bending modulus, etc., on the on rate of the myosin. Um, but it's, it's a constant, and that explains to you why you go here to a, a straight line. What is going on here? Why there is more instability the more we contract? At first, when we contracted, we killed the instability, because for the instability, initially, we needed the positive feedback of pushing, and the proteins, don't, you remember, the proteins are only curved like that. So what happens is that you think about having uh, some of these proteins initially here in the middle, where there's nothing now. And they, they started a, a protrusion, but myosin comes along, super strong, pulls in, right? So there's a lot of these proteins. Instead of being able to push out, they are pulled in by the very strong myosin. So these proteins find themselves now on the, on the minimum. They don't like that because they like curvature, which is protruding outwards. So they immediately have to go sideways, but they don't need to go very far because you see that the protrusion inwards actually forms on the two edges of it, two shoulders, which have exactly the right curvature for these proteins. So in fact, they are aggregated by these inwards uh, force, but only shifted. So they need to run after this uh, uh, aggregated region, which aggregates them. And that's why you get a propagating wave. So it's unstable because for instability, you must be able to aggregate these proteins and you are able to aggregate them. And in order to aggregate them, you must give them the right curvature that they're looking for. And you give them that, but only shift it from the force. And that's why it is, it is a running wave. And you can actually simulate it. Um, and again, for the simulations not to blow up, you need to be either slightly in the, in the uh, damped regime or to add one extra nonlinear term for the conservation of the proteins, for example. That's already enough to keep everything at bay and prevent things from blowing up. Uh, the wave velocity should be independent of the wave vector because it looked like a straight line. It's almost like a perfect sound velocity. And indeed, it looks like that's the case in the experiments with different wavelengths. They seem to have the same slopes. Um, in the experiments, they actually even calculated or measured, I would say, the velocity-velocity correlations over space. Um, and we can sort of match it with the model roughly. Uh, I don't know how convincing that is, but it's roughly there. Um, we predicted that as you increase the mass in contractility, the, the speed of the sound, the speed of the waves should increase. You remember like the square root? And that was actually found in this experiment. And when you kill the myosin contractility, you kill the waves. And that's what you see here, that when the drug was applied, the waves disappeared. And when the drug was washed out, the waves reappeared. Um, yeah, um, I don't think I have time for these other waves. I'll just, I'll just tell you that there are other kinds of waves which don't involve myosin. And in order to try to explain them, we suggested this model, where, in fact, we now have, again, three components. For a wave, you need three components. But we, we have now our usual component that we had before, the curved one, which is pushing outwards. But now we have one which is curved inwards, but it's still pushing upwards. So that alone, already from the work with AJ, we saw only gives damped waves. This alone gives us only these fixed protrusions, which can only grow. They cannot propagate. But in fact, together, we can propagate a wave. And that was an interesting result. Again, it's a three by three matrix. So analyzing it is more complicated. But, but, but you can get a, a, um, the, um, the phase diagram and understand what's going on, even in that more complicated system. And in the cell, as I showed you in the beginning, there are curved proteins of both kinds both outwards and inwards. Um, so I would say that the conclusion is that you can think of um, uh, uh, mechanical feedbacks as, as interesting additional um, you know, uh, mechanism or toolbox that's available for the cell or available for nature, but for the living uh, systems in particular, um, in order to produce patterns, not only biochemical reactions, 
which are there. They are biochemical reactions. They are more, very complicated. And they can also by themselves produce patterns. But there's also this feedback that we are suggesting from the mechanics. So I think it gives uh, physics students and physics researchers some opportunity to put in some physics into this pattern formation, which, again, as I said, goes beyond what people are researching, which is also a chemical reaction diffusion equations. Um, yeah, linear stability analysis is a very useful tool. Uh, it gives you analytical results, so it can give you some handle on a complicated system, which if you just write the basic equations of motion or the Hamiltonian, doesn't matter, uh, it immediately has many, many nonlinear terms, so you, 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 you are baffled about what, what could possibly go on here. Uh, so it gives you some handle, uh, but you always have to have like a small voice in your head after you're very happy with all your deep understanding and analytical results that you are limited to small fluctuations. And the nonlinearities, once you will allow them to show their ugly or nice face, depending on point of view, uh, they could drastically change things. So you have to remember that, and at some point you will need to also go beyond that. Um, so a lot of this work is summarized in this short review, but the review is a bit sort of uh, dense, so you can go th from the review to the original papers on all of these wave propagations and instabilities and, and whatever. Um, yeah, the review goes slightly beyond the linear stability analysis to show some other results, but not much more. And now what happens beyond when the membrane deformations are large, uh, this is what I'll show you tomorrow. So I hope this will give you like a good teaser to come on Saturday morning <laughs> to listen to a lecture. And I'll just uh, thank the many, well, these students and postdocs that did the work. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have plenty of time for questions. Uh, thank you for the exciting talk. Uh, I have a qu question. Uh, I think uh, in the first part of your talk, uh, you showed when you dealt with the Hamiltonian equilibrium steps, uh, you showed this possibility of interaction between the uh, proteins. Right. Between the proteins? Between the proteins. There is also interaction term between the proteins. Did yes. I understand that correctly? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's minus J N squared. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, in that term, I mean, looks like that it's unstable. Like if I put minus J N squared, I should put a, some K N to the power 4 to uh, stabilize that free yeah, energy, right? Yeah, well, you, you, you mean because there is this term minus J N squared? Yeah, not at higher order, nothing is stabilizing. Yeah, yeah. So, so you, you're you're right in that in that sense, but don't forget that we're only interested in the small fluctuations. So we're only interested to see when is this um, uh, aggregation, for example, can overcome thermal diffusion and cause uh, an instability, okay. even without active forces. Okay. To give you the conditions for the spinodal for the system to begin to phase separate, for example. And uh, this interaction is then, uh, is not further used in the presence of active forces, is it? Uh, so, so we did use this also in the presence of the active forces, but not in the last example that they showed with the waves. You're right. Okay. okay. In the last example of the waves, we, we removed that for simplicity, yeah. Hello. Hi, uh, very interesting talk. So, uh, are there any chances that there can be a standing wave created from all of these? Like, if these small fluctuations add up and uh, propagate for long enough to the boundaries? Yeah, so, actually, uh, this, this shows you, like, the initiation of, of the waves in this system. Ah, I cannot stop it. Um, so, you have here the dense, the local, the shape of the membrane, the local density of these curved proteins and these curved proteins, because we have here the, the two species. And it looks like a standing wave, but at some point, due to a s small nonlinear terms that we have to include in the simulation, indeed, so that it doesn't blow up, that goes to the previous question, um, uh, you'll see that the, this uh, symmetry between right-going and left-going waves 
uh, is broken and you don't get any more the standing wave and you begin to get this propagation in one direction. I see. But, but you can get, uh, of course, a standing wave solution also. Okay. Uh, you have explained the uh, cell protrusions in single cell. So do you think this the mechanism will be the same in collective cell migration? You mean, is it the same mechanism as... Uh, in collective cell migration. Or migration? Collective cells, yeah. If there is collective cells and it is moving, so the mechanism, mechanism will be the same or it will be different? For, for a cell to migrate? Yeah. yeah. Ah, okay. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, so that's, that's a good point. So initially when, when AJ and me were thinking about this model, we were thinking only about this protrusion of a migrating cell. Um, but then it became very complicated, so I decided let's leave that aside and let's think about other uh, protrusions and other deformations. But uh, what I will show you tomorrow is that exactly um, this kind of mechanism, but in a, in a very non-linear uh, behavior, so beyond this linear stability analysis, actually produces uh, something that, that looks very similar to the leading edge of cells. So what you're asking is that if you have, if you have a cell that's sitting on the surface, um, what, so let's say this is like a cut through the cell, or alternatively, if I look at the cell from above, what will make this cell, for example, form a protrusion in this part, and therefore uh, begin to move in this direction, something like that. And if I look at the cut through this object, through this line, then it will be like producing something which produce, pr protrudes in this direction and therefore makes the cell go in this direction. So um, since you see that this is really rather like a global uh, uh, event, um, the linear stability analysis is, is not good enough for that. Um, what we did do at the linear stability analysis level is that we took a, a, a 1D line, which you can think of it as a cell viewed from the top, okay, like a cell sitting on the surface viewed from the top, and we calculated the same model that I showed you in this talk, but we allowed for very few nonlinear terms in a simulation, in a, in a simple 1D simulation. And what we found is that initially, the linear stability analysis works very well. So initially what happens is that you have some population of these curved proteins, they push outwards, and rather quickly, let's say, the object begins to look like this. In this case, I took four, but it can be five or six. And each of these corners, you can think of them as a protrusion. And the, the, the wavelength of them is given indeed by this maximum of this, um, of this linear stability analysis calculation of omega. And this Q max is giving you this wavelength of the protrusion. So that works very well. But first of all, this is not really a, a going anywhere because it, it's always symmetric. It can be five, six, seven, but, but, but there's no like global breaking of symmetry. But to our surprise, even the few nonlinear terms that we added actually evolved the simulation from this uh, shape to a shape that looked like this. Um, maybe I'll draw it with another color. Um, so it looked like this. Okay. Now, instead of all these proteins co concentrated at the corners, like we had for the initial shape that formed quickly because of the linear instability, the, the, this big shape had all the proteins actually spread along a large front here. So you can say, wow, that's already what I'm looking for, for a cell that will go downwards with all these proteins which are pushing here in the front. But unfortunately, this thing was not really moving anywhere. And the reason it wasn't moving anywhere was that these proteins were happy with this curvature here, but they were even more happy with this curvature here. So there's always more of them actually located here. And if you summed up all the forces that they give, so a lot, a lot of small forces here, 
but uh, two large forces here, they summed up, up perfectly to zero, and we could actually prove why it was identically zero, because of the way these proteins followed exactly the curvature. And summing up over the curvature gives you zero in a closed contour. So, um, so yeah, so it, it turned out to be um, indicative that maybe we can use this mechanism eventually one day to get something which is fully polarized and really moving, but we needed to wait several more years in order to do the kind of simulations that I'll show you tomorrow uh, to fully get something which is really there. And that's really a result from, from the last uh, uh, year, one or two years, uh, that we have this, uh, this result here. Yeah. Ah, collection of cells. Ah, okay. So that that's a, that's a different story, I would say. I mean, you told about the myosin actin waves. So are they active in nature, or I mean, it's I mean not active. They are completely active. Uh, the, 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 I mean, you can you can think of this um, actin myosin waves. Um, and, and you can see that in order to make the wave propagate, so this is the shape of the membrane. This is H. And you can see that it's propagated from the blue to the green to the red. It's moving to the right. But uh, going on underneath, so if you think you, this is like the blanket. Imagine that you have a big bed and you have a blanket and you see a wave going on your blanket in your bedroom. You will not think that this is an inertial wave because you know that blankets cannot support waves. So you will surely lift the blanket and you'll see two kids one called myosin, one called actin, and they are out of phase with each other. One is pushing up, one is pushing down, and, and, and they are running after each other, and they are propagating the waves. So these are really active waves, because in this overdamped system, you cannot just initiate a wave and have it propagate. And, and yeah. one thing is that why cell is using energy for it? I mean, uh, for, uh, it, is not, it is active, but why I mean, it, the waves are formed? So the waves are formed because of this instability, because of the fact that when you pull strongly enough, you begin to form these shoulders that are able to aggregate these curved proteins strongly enough so that they now produce a lot of actin, a high aggregation of actin where they've aggregated. The myosin is following, disassembling here and assembling where there's new actin available and so on and so forth. So you can think of this, I don't know, another analogy is a guy with a beard this beard is the actin, and the myosin is trying to, like a kid, pull his beard, and he's running away from him. Something like that. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's all the time uh, ATP, which is consumed both by the myosin and by the actin polymerization. Yeah. It's consuming energy all the time. Nir, I have a question regarding this HIV. Uh, yes. Actin aster. Yes. Then you could you could have an invagination or an instability just because you have an aster and this actin pushing together. But what initiates the aster? So you're saying that the aster, the, the formation site is initiated by the curvature in this instance. By the viral proteins, which have a, a part of them, like a tail part of the protein, which is known to bind to a, a, a cellular protein, and an intrinsic cellular protein, which is nucleating actin polymerization, yeah. And you can, you can snip that part and make the virus form the, vir the virions, but without the ability of recruiting actin. And then you don't see those asters. In vitro assays, you also see spontaneous formation of asters, right? Yeah, but in these cells, as you saw in the, in the case when, when the, 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 actin, the actin recruiting ability of the virus was removed, um, the, you, you see that it looks... It looks rather smooth. You don't see nice asters like, like before. So a lot of this actin structure is, is gone. Yeah. There was another question. Yeah. So uh, you told that uh, during cell division, uh, there is formation of acting rings uh, to a specific site. So uh, does the ring formation or, uh, and the activity of the acti actin uh, actins uh, depends on the chemical gradients uh, present on that uh, particular positions? Yeah, so the simple model that I was alluding to here where basically we use the same simple feedback between curvature, local concentration of these proteins, 
and their ability to recruit some cytoskeleton that gives a force, in this case a ring that gives a, a, a contraction. That's a very simple model. And it might work in bacteria, but in eukaryotic cells, in order to find the, the, the location for the production of this ring, um, there are gradients which are produced. And these gradients are produced by the fact that, first of all, the, there is the replication of the DNA, and then the, um, the, um, these uh, microtubule uh, structures, these asters of microtubule form um, uh, the, uh, on two sides of, of, the, of the cell, the, the chromosomes are here. And these, these microtubules, they are catching the, the, the chromosomes, but at the same time, they are also affecting the membrane. So the, the membrane in this region and in this region becomes highly affected by these microtubules, which means that already the only part which is behaving differently is this part of the membrane, and so the, these gradients are already segregating the region which is relevant for the acting to form. It's prevented from forming here and here. And, and so, so there are other external objects which are sort of directing the acting to the right place. Uh, but still, it could be that even locally, you have this positive feedback between nucleation of the actin ring and the shape of these nucleators. So if the shapes of these nucleators like this invagination, there will be a locally this positive feedback. Uh, related uh, HIV budding out uh, question. So you have told that. Uh, so maybe, maybe during the break. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, okay. wants to make a quick announcement. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Okay.